So with that, I'd like to invite the panel up, if I may. And I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. You guys ready? Bob Beaumont, if you would take your seat. Jordan Green, Joe Barber, would you join me, please? Okay. I, since I'm the oldest, I'll do my quick bio. Um, and I, I, and I'll, I'll relate purely to ASTM because that's what we're here for. I can't remember when James and I first had a conversation about this thing. Maybe ten, maybe ten years ago. And we were having a coffee one day, and he said to me, "What would you invest in? You know, that isn't hard work when you're trying to exit offshore." I said, "Well, something that's brand." You know, and uh, what Aussie's known for, well, they're kind of known for their sport, globally, okay? And not, not in any particular sport, but as a general thing, we've been doing pretty well for quite a long time post-Second War, okay? So we're highly recognisable as being above the cutting general run, if you like. Well, we do well in the Olympics and whatever, okay? We do... A, some well in our own local stuff, like the AFL and that type of thing, but that's not transferable, right? Tennis used to be on top of the team globally for a long time. Yeah, kind of slid a little bit. You know, Olympics, Commonwealth Games, many different things, right? And uh, when I came back to Australia in the early 90s, um, bored after 20 years of doing what Jerry was doing and a few others as a VC, um, I, I discovered very quickly, right, that there was actually no community like what's sitting here today, which is just fantastic. Right? And I thought I'd have to start with a clean sheet of paper. And ASTN I couldn't see at that time at all. So I was asked by a certain um, drinking... VB Prime Minister, actually just passed shortly, why can't we have a venture capital industry in Australia? And I kind of laughed at the guy uh, and said, well, listen, Bob, you know, this is not the Australia Cup. We're not down in San Diego. And uh, that's, uh, that's one thing we have to really think about. You know, there is no money for VC. So before I go any further, I'm not going to rattle on about this. I just want to do, go back to the show of hands, right? Because hubs and communities of innovation are really important. It's not just about the entrepreneurs, but everything around you and, and how, that, how fluid that is to ultimately get our entrepreneurs off the ground. Okay, so show of hands. Who of our entrepreneurs has actually got revenues? Well Yay, done. Fantastic. You got your Fantastic. Okay. Who's in the sort of heart? I'm not going to the time. Who's in the half million to say five million turnover? Hands up. Roughly. Yeah, okay. Who's in five million plus? All right, good. Okay. All right. Last question of the entrepreneurs. How many of you have ever sought money from an angel or a VC or 3F, you know, friends, family, Phil? Okay. How'd you go? Well done. You must have had a convincing argument. All right. Was your mum or? Excellent. Fantastic. Down. Any other thumbs? Okay. It's not exactly a great contact sport, is it? Okay. So we'll try and help you today to better understand whether you should think about are you in that curve that Jerry was talking about, right? And if you like, I'll put it in the simple terms. You know, I'd probably class us as uh, smart money, not dumb money. Okay. And we'll explain that as we go along. Jordan? Look, I, I, I founded or co-founded about uh, 15 different technology companies. Uh, but more importantly to this experience is I, uh, I was over in the United States uh, founding a software startup in Silicon Valley uh, in the 90s. And I came back at the end of the 90s and, and met Bob. Uh, and I came back having raised venture capital in, in Silicon Valley. So when I left Australia, there was no venture capital here. And when I came back, I said, that's exactly what we need. This is what we should do. And all my friends in Silicon Valley were telling me that, 
or you're now the perfect person to be working in venture capital because you've got a technical background, you've got operational experience, you've got success, you've got failure, you've raised money, right? So you've got the profile. Uh, so I came back to Australia. There was some embryonic venture capital here, uh, which for a variety of reasons was never going to work, but it was great that it had got started. And I managed to get a small private equity or a small privately funded venture capital fund going here in Melbourne. Uh, we delivered an eight times return in five years, which for those of you who may not know is basically a world class performance. Australia being Australia, that very performance prevented us from getting a second fund. Uh, so meanwhile, I was looking for another way to solve the problem. How do I get all the, the parasitic elements out of the system and just get the people with a great idea and the passion to really give it a go and, and make it happen and the people who can really help them and happen to have some money as well? And lo and behold, it turns out that's called angel investing. And uh, at the time, there was one angel group in Australia and that was started by Bob and it was very much at that stage uh, quiet, under the radar, sort of, uh, dinner club model, which was doing very well for themselves. They had had a go years before coming out and getting the community on board. It hadn't worked, but I decided that's what we should do. So I started the organized angel investing community in Australia and built it up to, uh, well, under that umbrella, built it up to over 15 groups around Australia. And now I'm still the, the founder and president of Melbourne Angels, which is currently the number one angel group in Australia. We invest at this early stage that Jerry was talking about. Uh, and I have a very simple answer for you on valuation. Every company post family, friends and fools, all the way up to and including Series A, every round of investment, you should expect to sell 20% of the company. Plus or minus a little bit, but 20% of the company. So it actually doesn't matter how much the company is worth, it matters how much money you want to raise, and whether investors believe that that amount of money is going to allow you to hit those inflection points that Jerry was talking about. What's, uh, what's actually interesting with this group, just before I go into my background, is there are three generations, you realise, of federal grants. So Bob was with the, the old Comet program originally and then uh, structured the commercialisation Australia. Jordan was commercialisation Australia for how many years? Four years? Five years? Five years. Five. Five years. And just as Jordan left, it became accelerating commercialisation, which Stephen Goodall would have talked to you about this morning, which is what I also do. Over the years, I've had... Uh, 14 startups. Um, I've had three good exits. Two put me into uh, bankruptcy. So my first exit, uh, which was Planet Internet, back in the mid 90s, we were doing uh, selling Netscape 0.6, one of the very early internet service providers. Great exit. My next startup, I put the whole five million in effectively over a period of about uh, two years. I didn't think. Because with other people's money, you consider how you spend it, I just blew it. Every time someone said, are you sure you want to buy that brand new couch, the leather couch? I go, yeah, it's my money, go away. And sure enough, I burnt the whole lot, went into, uh, or did a part 10. Um, and I've done that twice. The last exit I had, uh, I've, I've lived in the valley, I've had a wearable in the valley. Um, I've taken VC funding from the US, from the UK. I've had a business, or still do, in Malaysia. Um, and the market here in Australia, my last exit was about five and a half years ago, um, and I started doing the AC work, which I think is probably the most amount of fun. Um, I see around 15 companies a week, or 15 ideas and everything else. I work with most of the incubators, Accelerator, I work with the Monash MBA program, and I see some amazing stuff. I also do a number of uh, some private investing, which can't crossover, obviously, from a conflict of interest point of view. Um, and from an investor's point of view, I've put my private angel hat on. I work with three high net worth family groups predominantly. And we look for things in certain segments. And there are two things that really I look for. The first one is I want to know not how I get into your investment or into your startup. I want to know how to get out. I know how to get in. I can transfer money. I can sign agreements. I can look at the structure. I've got accountants and lawyers that can help with that but I want to know how to get out. What's the exit? Now, it won't always be a guaranteed exit. It won't always be an IBM or a trade sale. IPO is not an exit, so I won't talk about that. Um, there will always be an exit vision. If you don't know where you're headed for an exit, how do you know what journey or path or direction you should take? And that's my big issue. The second thing we always look for is validation. If you've got, I like early stage, very, very early stage, because you can get 
uh, a reasonable stake of the business without a lot of dough and you could leverage your own network. So within the family group, we could leverage our networks in large private companies to do help with uh, validation and checking. But if you haven't got any validation at all, if you've got this great idea with no customer validation whatsoever, or you haven't crossed, you know, as more talked about with the technology curve, you haven't crossed that um, early adopter chasm, um, then I'm not interested. You know, I see a lot of companies that say, this is by far the most important thing you'll ever see. Um, and I'll give an example, hopefully he's not in the room. It was a self-heating disposable coffee cup. Um, and it was absolutely unbelievable. But So when you click this little tag, it heated the cup up, but he'd done no market validation. He'd spent 400000 on patents and moulds and everything else, but it turns out at $11 a disposable coffee cup, there was no market, and you had a tenth of a millimetre of cardboard between you and a highly toxic chemical. And that is an example where his passion, his enthusiasm, his lack of diligence in research, he just failed to validate the next step. And, you know, just on a final note, if I can, I see it a lot. What happens is that you identify a problem, a gap, or an issue, or an opportunity in the market segment you're in, the domain you're in, and you go, right, I know the answer for that. You thunder down a path of finding a solution, which is fantastic. That point, you should go back to market opportunity and, and explore it further. Most entrepreneurs, though, will go from, I know how to solve that problem, straight to commercialization and try and find customers. Instead of going back and doing some preliminary validation, some, you know, revalidate the original assertions of the problem actually existing. I'm going to ask Jerry to sit down and shut up. Right. Okay. Um, I asked who had uh, revenues. Let's uh, have our hands on those that are pre revenue. Okay. That's a small one. That's one each. Is that okay? We'll break down and go for coffee. Yeah. Um, valuing, you know, pre-revenues is um, a bit like Jerry said. You know, it's, it's all worth that. Okay. So let's just talk, and I think we'll talk panel-wise about tips. What gets us excited, right? I'll give you my first bit about a pre-revenue company that gets me excited. You know? And one of the reasons that I met this uh, guy and the late John Freeman about, oh God, I don't know, 25 years ago, whatever. You know? Well, I was developing my angel group. I only had 12 guys. We called ourselves the Dirty Dozen. Okay? There's two of us still living. The other 10 are dead. Okay, I'm a survivor. Now, these were very high net worth guys. We uh, invested over $100 million in a very short period of time. And i got to tell you that about 60% uh, of it went belly up. Okay, As we got to the latter stage, I said to the guys, I think I've got a great idea. I've looked at some of these Californian programs through UC, and especially the, if you like, fund managers course that was being held at UC Berkeley, Huss. I said, I'm going to take some entrepreneurs there, but... I got to talk to the academic because I don't think the academic will let my entrepreneurs in. Is that true, Jerry? Yeah, bit of conflict. So we arrived, about ten of us, okay. And all these ten had asked me to invest, right? And I, I just simply said, "Look, I'm not going to make that decision, right? I'm going to let you make that decision. I'm going to put you through two weeks, right, of Jerry Engel and John Freeman." And all the panelists, you'll never meet in a million years, but you've heard or read about whatever. All right? So I took them all off. I'm going to pat him on the back now. You know, the, the five best guys out of that, I can tell you now, were Lee Jasper. Anyone know who Akinex is? You know what the exit was? Yeah, one point. That's right. Okay. Justin Spangaro. Anyone heard of Peregrine Chips? Next, FabQ. Yeah, 400 million. Okay. Mark Heffernan. Okay. The company had at the time failed miserably. Actually, the next two failed, and I put money into both of them, so I learned my lesson. And then recently, thanks to ACCA, 
that we plotted a company in a convergence between human cancers into companion pets, next pet. It floated. Anyone got an idea what it floated for on the NASDAQ? No, that's right. Okay. Approximately. Approximately. They're, they're about, right? I've got to tell you that that was a sort of 35 times uh, return. Thank you. Um, and uh, the hard reality, it wasn't on the, AS, on the uh, stock X for very long because along came the target that Heffernan had answered me when I first met him when I asked him who was he going to sell the company to, let alone start it, which was a certain Japanese veterinary pharmaceutical. That gives you some idea, you know, of how easy it can be when you get somebody like this guy, right, to teach entrepreneurs and their networks how to support a real opportunity but also to really clarify the opportunity, right? And that's the real issue. My term has always been every guy I've ever invested in, anyone I've ever helped with, grants or whatever, I always ask them the same question, right? Look, I can get in, but I'm only interested in getting out. And the older I get, the more I use the term, you know, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, okay? So if somebody gives me 10 to 20 times my money in five years, well, that's pretty cool, you know? I've helped a lot of you guys in sports tech, and you're not venture opportunities. For those that are pre-money, you need to qualify yourself as quickly as you can to think about whether you really are venture bait. And for smart money, not dumb money. That's my tip. All right? Sounds brutal, I know, but that's, that's the terms of the deal. Uh, tip. Um, well, just a, a bit about valuation quickly. Uh, so as, as Jerry mentioned earlier, uh, you can think about every company, at the, certainly at the startup stage, as essentially being worth zero. And the company is worth what the market will, what the buyer will pay for it, and that's what the investor is. Right? So the investor sets the price. Equally, when you move later and you read about some, some company that got invested at a billion dollar valuation, they got a $30 million or a $100 million investment at a billion dollar valuation, there is no arithmetic model that will justify that billion dollar valuation. It's about the investors inflating the valuation to make enough room for how much of the company they want to buy with the money they're willing to put in. So this is not something your accountant can do much to help you with. Now later on, when you've got substantial revenues and profits and you're paying taxes, there are accounting methods for valuation, which will be relevant to getting loans and to getting listings and all sorts of things. But when you're talking about high growth companies and investors who are seeking high growth returns, valuation is about managing the strategy of the business for future success. So if you overvalue the business at the beginning, if you walk in, if you come into Melbourne Angels and you say we're worth $5 million, and we're here to raise $500,000, and we'll say no. We'll say, uh, what we say is very simple. We say we will we'll invest $500,000 on a pre-money valuation of $2 million or less. Right? That's that 20% ballpark that I was talking about. And part of the reason for that is the model for value growth is in this game of high growth businesses is that you have to be looking to at least double your value every year for the next five to eight years. Now to hit that performance, when you start off being worth $2 million, you have to go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. That's within reason something that's quite doable. And since over 85% of all exits, M&A exits in the world happen for less than $50 million, you're in the ballpark. You've got a really good chance of seeing something happen. Mm -hmm. But what if you came in and you said you're worth $5 million, $10, 20 40 $80 million. Now you're out of the ballpark, you're into that more esoteric space. And the thing about the more esoteric space for exits is that it's not evenly distributed. It's skewed towards the big end. So if you're not gonna fit into the, mo into the, the mass market of exits, for want of a better description, you're going to have to really hit the ball out of the ballpark. You're going to have to go for that $500 million plus type exit to have a really good chance. Of course, exits happen all the way along the continuum, but when you look at how they cluster, that's how they cluster. So the consequence of overvaluing your business at the beginning is you're setting a hurdle for yourself that is very high, and astute investors generally don't want to take that risk because it's not a smart risk. 
So something to understand. Startup investors are not about avoiding risk. It's quite the reverse. Startup investors want to take risk. That's why we're there. So when people come to me and tell me, oh, here are all my numbers and they're all conservative, I just say, go away. I'm not interested in conservative. I'm interested in credible. I'm interested in what you can really achieve. And it might be a little bit scary to you that the numbers look a little bit big. But show me what you really think you can achieve and together we can figure out the upside and downside. Right? But we want to take the risk because that's how you get the reward. You've all heard the expression, risk reward. High risk, high reward. Now, if you overvalue your company at the beginning, uh, Jerry alluded to a thing called a down round. The next round of investment happens at a valuation lower than the previous round. It's very painful to you and all the other people who are already invested. It's a, it's a very likely outcome. The most likely outcome of overvaluing your business is you can't raise more money. In the first half of 2019, 15% of all rounds in Silicon Valley were down rounds. Right? So a very substantial percentage. It doesn't actually speak about all the companies who just couldn't raise money at all, which is a much, much bigger number. And there's only one good answer that satisfies people in the future about why the down round won't happen again. And that is, we change the people. Which means the founding team will almost certainly either be shifted to the side or completely out of the company. So valuation is both an art and a science, but it's all about building a strategy for future success. It's not about sweat equity, it's not about the salary you sacrificed by giving up your corporate job. It's not even about how much money you and your family and friends have put in. All of those things are relevant factors to consider, but it's a future looking activity. All right, a, a couple of uh, tips. Couple of tips. I always avoid family, friends and full or fans. Uh, it makes for horrible Christmases, horrible birthday parties, and I've seen it a lot. So you've the, the thing with the triple F investment or the family, friends and fools, they tend to just believe in the person. So they're, think, they're, they're believing in you as an individual rather than anything you're showing them. And, you know, you could be getting 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, but sure enough, things will go wrong. And then suddenly your brother-in-law says, I just crashed my car, I need that 10 grand back, can I have it tomorrow? Or suddenly something else happens. So the family, friends and fools option, I'm always very nervous of. And as uh, the, the other thing is that Jordan pointed out, I get people coming to me all excited uh, at the AC program saying, ah, oh, they've just closed around at 12 million uh, pre-money valuation on something they haven't even written a line of code on. And that's not an achievement. You know, a lot of founders seem to think that the higher the valuation they can get away with, the greater their success. And that is so not true. You know, what I look at and what I uh, take people through is a reverse valuation model. You know, there are, Jerry had on one of his slides all these valuation inflection points, which you can define. If you work backwards from those inflection points and look at what your target exit is with the target company and work backwards so that at your seed level, everyone is getting a reasonable return, that's the sort of logic you want there. You want to make sure that at every step, someone is winning. Imagine me coming in as a seed investor and you've, you've done a deal on me and you've got me in at eight, eight million pre-money and suddenly you go out to raise and the next round's at eight and a half million, I lose interest, I move on. Or I get really annoyed with myself for picking a bad horse. So you want to keep every investor highly engaged and working for you because that's a free resource. You bring on an investor, you get a free resource with an extraordinary network. You bring on Bob, you get an investment network throughout the US. You know, Jordan throughout Australia and the US. Mine's mainly on the East Coast and in Malaysia and now up in China. So your seed investors are not just someone with a bunch of money. It's an entire network, it's a free resource and they're extended resources. So you've suddenly got an IP challenge in China. Sure enough, your seed investor will have a contact that's done that before. Or you go to Madrix apparently. Just thought I'd throw that in. Um, the, the final thing about valuation is you should always be raising. Don't stop raising. The day you start your business, you start raising. Now, if you're not ready for venture capital, that's okay. Start meeting them 12 months beforehand. I call it friend raising. You know, if you turn up on Jordan's doorstep and say, I want 200,000, he goes, who are you? 
But if you've been to functions, you've been to the Melbourne Angels functions, you've been to the functions where the VCs are at, you start to meet these people. You go to Blackbird and you say, what is it that you look for in your companies? What structure do you expect? You speak with Jordan, you go to those functions, you learn that they like to see a single flat company structure. When you're ready to raise, you turn up to Jordan, he goes, hi, how are you? How's that XYZ innovation coming along? He said, well, we just happen to be ready to raise. He'll go, come on through. I know what you're doing. Same with venture capital firms. You know, don't just turn up on their doorstep. It's a relationship you're building. You don't just turn up to a pub and say, oh, I'll marry you. Well, some do, I suppose. But, um, you know, it's all about building that relationship. And when you're ready to go to the US, hopefully you've spent two years going there prior, building those networks and relationships. So when you turn up and you say, I'm ready to open in the Valley, or I'm ready to open in, in Texas, Austin or wherever it might be, that you've already got those networks that you've worked for two years that'll help you and say, I can get you an office here or I can help for funding here because they know what you're doing and they've lived that journey with you. And the final thing, Bob, before, yeah. before I finish, is research. You know, I get very, very annoyed. Like, I do the AC program, I do my own investing. I get very annoyed when people approach me and say, would you like to invest in this company? And I have no investments in that market. I have no interest in that market. I don't work in that market, they haven't done their research. I just helped one of the AC companies close out just under two million worth of the next round of funding from three investors. Every single investor presentation was highly customised for that investor. It looked at their other investments, how uh, investing in their entity would benefit their other investments. It looked at the uh, the market segments they are in. So every investor presentation was highly focused. Don't come to me and ask for money if you've got a med tech or pharmaceutical because I just don't do it. I'm an IT guy. If IT fails, no one dies. That's the problem with pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical is a 15-year experience. I like to be in and out within three. So do your research about your angel investors. They're not hard to find. You go to LinkedIn and there's 350 angel investors listed for, for Melbourne. You don't just go and hit them up without doing some research. Almost stalk them in the background, understand their psych, so that when you're talking to them, you can talk about the investment they've just made in eSports and the eSports team, and how they're doing in these other areas, and how what you have fits in nicely with their portfolio. And suddenly you might get a little peek on, on valuation, but more importantly, you get a network that will benefit your startup. Thanks, Joe. I think that's uh, great advice. Look, and for those of you feeling a bit downtrodden as far as am I a venture capital angel, you know, opportunity, right, don't be too depressed about that, especially it doesn't matter if you're early revenues or whether you're pre-revenue environment, right? Tips are important to listen to, you know, the guys. I mean, I think Jordan's probably got a three dozen investment. Yeah, oh, more. yeah, probably more. Say 40-odd, right? Um... Firstly, I've done a little over 100, right, over a very long period of time uh, and only about 20 of those in Australia, right? And every time if I look for one common element that sort of really got me excited was when somebody came up and said, I understand, Mr Bowman, what you made your money out of. I hate LinkedIn. I never should have gone on the bloody thing, <laughs> right? Seriously, right? I hate Google. I hate most of the search engines. Right? And I've tried to be, if you like, in the dark all my life. I don't like people knocking on the door, you know, and I learned very quickly when I came back from the valley in the early 90s that, you know, I seemed to be the only guy on this rock that had any money. I mean, Joe see 15 a week, you know, I used see 15 a day. And I thought, no, this can't go on, right? So Joe's point about really a great definition of dumb money Dumb money is when somebody knocks on your door and says, oh, you've got money and I've got an opportunity. Smart money is when you knock on the door and say, look, uh, I understand you made your money out of. That's exactly the target market I'm looking for. They're the customers. And I think the existing suppliers aren't doing a great job and I've got an opportunity here that might make them a little bit upset and maybe even redundant, you know. I'm going to have a uh, digital photo instead of uh, a Kodak print. You know, we all know them well and truly. You know, wearables, you know, the best 
opportunity I have was about six, seven weeks ago, a guy came up to me and said, I've read your papers, Mr. Beaumont, on um, deep box imagery. I said, that's bloody 25 years old. Now, silly enough, I think John tried to get me to do a PhD in it. And I said, John, I'm no good at that. So I can firelight, but, you know, I can't keep it burning. I'm too old, right? And I said, well, what's your model to market? And he said, I want to give every single one away. I said, oh, great. You know, that's the, the Lady Gillette model, is it? Okay, right. So every... Uh, 35-year-old male and 45-year-old female in the country, we're going to give one of these wristwatches to and stick it around their wrist and collect their data and tell them when they're crook and sell it off to the doctors to fix it. And I said, well, we just hang on a minute, right? I said, it's a good idea, but at the end of the day, you've only gone part of the distance. Nice of you to identify something I did back when dinosaurs still roamed the country, because you know, it was that long ago. Right. But today, you know, you really got to be with it on the basis of simply saying, I know who I'm going to kill. I think it was Mark Heffernan, first time I ever met Mark, I knew his father very well, he had the Ford dealership in Wangaratta. Five brothers, and he was a rover in Wangaratta Rovers. So for you sports guys that know a little bit of football, and he was a bloody good one too, by the way, good one. But his father sent him off to Dublin, right, and he was my intern for about 18 months when I had Shelbourne Ventures over in Dublin. Uh, and what I really liked about this guy is he knew how to do his research. He also knew how to pick the eyes out of the existing suppliers. He knew their weak spots. He was a good football player. Uh, he knew who he could run around and who he'd have to run through. Uh, people like that at you. Can that turn a slow-moving company into a fast-moving company? Sometimes. Jordan, you have one of those experiences where, before, you know, it just clicked? Uh, before you throw it to Jordan for just, a second, yeah. I'd like to throw it to the audience sure. and open it up. So let's use the time we have. Would you like to help me? And get some perspective and questions from you. Hands up. Let's see where you are. Go for it. And introduce yourself, please, so we have context. Hi, my name's Andrew. Uh, I'm from Alert Equine Science. I've got a question. It's interesting when we talk about um, what interests you in a piece of technology. What about if you've never seen the technology before and it is something completely new? How do you actually make a decision based on me coming to see you and say, want to see something no one's ever seen before? Th there'll be uh, two things that, that I'll pick up on. One is that... Uh, you'll know the exit and you'll, you'll show a vision for the exit and who the exit might be. You'll have some part in validation and then I'll use my network. Um, I don't, I very rarely uh, invest singly. I'm not at the 40 or 60 level, probably at the 12 or 13. Um, but I'll use my network. And there's nothing that new. It'll still be in an industry. If you're in the, you know, if it's something very, very new in the equine industry, I'll either be in there or I'm not. Um, you know, there aren't that many new sectors. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd certainly start by saying I don't believe you that it's brand new. I believe that you've got a new application and that you've got a niche market that you're targeting who, for whom you're delivering some very specific benefits and you can explain those to me. So if I know there are some really good benefits and it makes sense and there's some evidence you can share with me about why your market will choose your benefits over the ones they're already getting or the ones they could get from someone else, uh, then that would all be interesting. And at some point down the track, we can drill down to see whether or not the technology is as revolutionary as you think it is. But best technology almost never wins. It's about knowing your market, knowing your competition, and having some benefits people, you can demonstrate people are willing to pay good money for. If they'll pay for the benefits, you've got a business. And that's just a question of how big it is. Let's go with the next question. Oh, come on. You didn't sit here all afternoon and go brain dead on it. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. You're too easy. You're the softball. <laughs> Don't let him do it. He's an organizer. Let's get a real person. Come on. I'm just going to force him, Bob. You have treasure up here. Where's your Who question? wants money? Who's looking for money? One. Only one person is looking for money at the moment, investment. <laughs> Who advises people on looking for money? Is that it? 
No wonder. Go for a question. Uh, everyone well, else may, right. Bring us with a question. Yeah, we're, we're looking for money. So. Oh, but give us with a, a question that pertains to you. Come on, let's go. <clears throat> so you mentioned um, some of the, um, how you should be cautious on the um, friends and family round. So what would you suggest would be a logical first round of funding then? To, just to go straight to seed? Uh, look, seed's very broad. You know, I've taken 50,000 and called it seed, um, right up to about 1.5 million still called it seed. The danger with family and friends is that no matter how much you document, the expectation is that when they want their money back, you've got to provide it back. So if you, see, you know, with some friends it may be different, and I've taken money from a former work colleague who is a kind of friend, but a very high net worth. So it was, a, it was more of a work relationship. Yeah, I, I think it's about managing expectations. So I, I, I'd say a little bit differently to Joe. I'd say that family, I agree, family and friends are, are investing in the, in the family. They're investing in the person. They don't really understand the opportunity. They don't understand the business. And if they're honest, they probably don't ever expect to see their money again. So it's usually a pretty small amount of money. And as long as those expectations are, are surfaced, so when we invest in companies, there's, there may be some family and friends we expect them to be very small equity shareholders and we just expect them to go for the ride. And as long as they understand that's what they're there for, is to go for the ride, but they can't just turn around and ask for their money back because it doesn't work that way. Now, if you're in China, it does. That's a whole different story. But in the rest of the world, in the Western world, you've got to go along for the ride all the way to the end. So I, we don't mind if there are some pre-existing investors, but they have to be completely vanilla, ordinary shares, no special rights, and they come along for the ride. I've yeah, got an AC grant recipient whose father wants 200,000 back at the next round of funding and he's refusing to budge. So it's impacting his next round of funding because the father wants his money back. Mr. Uh, Richard Gannon. Uh, Richard. Is ageism a big factor? Is ageism a big factor um, both in Australia and globally in terms of looking at founders? Great question. And well, sec. One question. We have such a demand for questions, you only get one. Ageism. Let me put it this way. Gender and age? Yeah, I mean, the average average age of a founder in the United States is 47 years old. Yeah. The average age of a founder in Australia is 42 years old. So if if by ageism you're saying, is there a bias towards younger people or against older people, I'd suggest probably not. However, Almost all of the truly spectacular successes are started by very young people, and the reason that ha- happens almost certainly is their naivete. They don't know what they're not supposed to be able to do, so they do it. Whereas, so they're very uncertain, they're out at the tail of risk, and they're out at the tail of return. You come in a little bit, you get older, more experienced people, they're much more likely to have a success, but it's lo- less likely to be quite as big. Yes, right here. Hi, gents. Am I on? Yeah, speak up. Uh, Ollie Howard here. Um, when you're investing and you first meet uh, a founder, what are the major red flags that can go off for you? If they, if they tell a lie, if they think they're unique, if they don't want to hear what other people have to say, those would be a good place to start about bad things. For me, it's single founder. I'm well, very, very nervous about single founders because they don't listen to advice, they don't take guidance, they do what they want, they don't have anyone else to answer to. Um, there are exceptions, there are always exceptions where you've got a single founder that's got a 15-year mentor that's playing an active part of the advisory board or in, in involvement. But, um, and someone that hasn't done their research, that annoys me a lot. When someone says, just imagine you were doing X and it's not something I'd ever do. That frustrates me. So that Bob, red um, I'm with him. I, I got two golden rules when it comes to investing. Um, husband and wife combinations. Right. And single families. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, I did make one exception. But I wasn't wrong. Okay. Yeah, but I wasn't wrong. No, I went wrong. The marriage deteriorated. Right. Right. The fortunate part about it is the company went up, not down. <laughs> It was the wife that made it success, the husband left, which was a good idea. And I'll give you one other. A founder who says they want to build 
a world-dominating unicorn. Because yeah. you can't plan for that. You can plan to dominate a niche market and make a, you know, a $300 million business. But you can't plan to be extraordinary in success. So if that's what they're absolutely committed to, they're locked in, then that issue that the, everyone was saying before about wanting to get your money out, you're never going to get money okay. out from them. Okay, I have your last question, rare commodity. Okay, going oh, once. Okay. Over there. Over there, please. Great question. I think I'm going to repeat it for you because your microphone didn't pick up. But as I understood the question, it was, what do you wish you were seeing more of? Is that correct? Yes. Great question. Would everybody take their turn at this, please? What do you want well, to see I mean, more that's, of? A, that's a great question because that leads to the research. If you know what I'm interested in, I've written, I think, in the last five years, I've written three LinkedIn posts in total. But it does say the areas I'm interested in, and that's robotics and AI. Um, I find that uh, that feel quite fascinating, anything in the IT side, and I'm doing a lot in prop tech as well. That's all in my profile. You know, there's lots of other areas that would be great, but just doesn't interest me. Okay. Uh, what, what, <laughs> what I wish um, I saw more of is people trying to solve really challenging problems in a very compelling way. The problem that I see in Australia is, and it happens at all levels of our society, we're just too comfortable. And so what we see is a plethora of people all trying to solve a really small problem. It's not that hard to solve, which means there's lots of competition, not a lot of opportunity, and almost certainly you're going to be outcompeted by somebody with deeper pockets from a more aggressive market and culture. So I wish I, we were seeing a lot of much, much more challenging propositions with really good ideas who are dedicated to solving a really hard problem. Because if you solve a really hard problem, you're far less likely to have competition at that point in your growth. At my age, and probably in the last 10, 15 years, because I've only made about five or six investments, the rest have been top-ups, typical family uh, <coughs> portfolio. Um, I probably go back to where I, I started and I learnt the lessons really quickly. When somebody out of my network of advisors and suppliers and, and helpers and accountants and law and bits and pieces, and I think of my time particularly in the US where I had a great relationship with Wilson Sonsini, uh, who probably provided 40% of our investment portfolio, bought it to me and said, Bob, we think your team is just the right one for this signal and maybe only a one person entrepreneur, okay? And because I trust these people and I trust their judgment, you know, I listen straight away. But then I'm looking for the same two things that Joe and Jordan are talking about, okay? Not to validate that the networks give me a bum steer, right? But just that this is disruptive, it's fresh, it's doable. Right? We can assemble a team in a hurry. Right? And I learnt that thing very quickly. The great teams will beat great tech every day of the week. Fantastic. Thank right, you. Can That's I just say one more thing? Sorry, Jerry, to interrupt. Okay. But it, it's actually... Um, it came... And this is going to be a government pitch for my government work so I can justify being here. But I was trying to have a landing pad in Tel Aviv and recently we were able to hear Omri from Tel Aviv come out and it's very relevant with Jerry here and what uh, Jordan and, and Bob have been saying. In Tel Aviv, you go global or you go home. There is no local market. Stop thinking local market only. When I hear from what you're doing, I want to know that you've researched the globe. It may be Asia, it may be parts of Europe, it could be North or South or both of the Americas, but go global. So it's think big or go home, or go global or go home, is what they say in Tel Aviv. And it was one of the most interesting things for all our AC companies is to realise the domestic market's not where it's at. N majority of the time, I'm generalising. But you've got to think big. Good words of wisdom. So with that, let's think, thank Joe Barber, Jordan Green, Bob Beaumont. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.